Hey, Joel here, and welcome to another exciting edition of Engineering Roundtable. This week, I have a project that I've been uh, mulling around my brain for some time, and I finally made it come to fruition. I have uh, a first world problem, you see, and that is uh, my electric blanket is not on when I get home late at night, and I really want to just come home and crawl into a nice warm bed. So I decided to solve this first world problem by hacking my electric blanket. Disclaimer, electric blankets can be dangerous. Uh, they are known to cause fires, they, they wear out over time. I have not had any problems with my electric blanket, even though it was over 10 years old, but it definitely degraded in its uh, efficiency. It looks much like this, it's a sunbeam, and it's got a very old school, traditional rheostat sort of control, much like you would see in your thermostat in your home. I took this apart and thought, no, this might be a little trickier to hack. You have to have some sort of motor to turn the dial. And also, without the dial, you it's really hard to know which temperature you're at. I went out and got a new electric blanket a few months back, this time going with the Biddeford model. And again, uh, this one has the, the analog dial, which is just a potentiometer underneath. Uh, the inside is a little more uh, newfangled. It's got actual electronics, printed circuit board. So my first plan of action was to figure out the actual mechanism I was going to use to control the, the dial. Uh, one of my first thoughts was to actually mount or glue a servo motor on here and have it move from different temperatures. And I thought that might be a little redundant, a motor controlling a dial and, and so on and so forth. The other thing I began thinking about was I still wanted to be able to have the manual control from my bedside. So I want to be able to turn it on uh, via the internet from wherever I'm at so I can come home to a nice warm bed. But once I'm in bed, I don't want to have to get on my phone or my computer to control the thing uh, when it's right there. One of our fellow Spark Funyuns, Jeff, gave me the idea to use a digital potentiometer and sort of bypass the potentiometer in here with the dial. This was the route I almost went until I went on the Bediford website and realized they have digital controllers. And so I called, called them up. And this nice old lady uh, answered the phone and jokingly asked, who chewed through the cord, the cat or the dog? And I sort of explained to her, no, I just <clears throat> need an extra one for, you know, I didn't explain the purpose of the project, but she was understanding and sent me the controller for free, which was excellent. So thank you very much for that. The other side of this project is the web interface. I chose an Arduino Uno and uh, the Wi-Fi Shield from SparkFun to act as my portal from my room out into the rest of the world via the internet. And I will also be going over how I set that up both the settings on the Wi-Fi shield itself, uh, the code, and then describing a little bit how to port that outside of your own home wireless network so that you can access it from anywhere in the world. Here we have my prototype. On the left we have the Bideford digital controller, and on the right we have the Arduino board hooked up to the Wi-Fi shield. So the first thing I did was open up the digital controller to reveal the board inside. Uh, it has its own microcontroller and uh, some rectifiers to turn the AC power to DC and a variety of other components. Disclaimer number two is be very, very careful when dealing with AC power. In order to probe the buttons and such to find their voltage and whether they were active high or active low, the device needed to be plugged into the wall while I was measuring it. Be very careful that you don't touch the wrong thing while probing around with your multimeter. Uh, as you can see, I have some wires attached to the three buttons here. We have the on and off button, which just has a sort of button state mode. Press once for on and once again for off. Then we have the temperature up button and the temperature low button. Rather than analyzing the microcontroller on the board and deciphering what sort of signals it was sending, I decided it would be a lot easier to just hack the buttons. So that way, all I have to do to control the digital controller is pull one of these buttons low with the Arduino. 
The only caveat was that I had to declare these pins as inputs when they are not being used as outputs to pull the pins low. That way these buttons over here still have their functionality when I'm bedside. So you can see I could still turn it on and change the temperature from this side. Now that we've gone over the hardware side a little bit, let's dive into the software. On the Wi-Fi shield, there exists HTML code that serves up a web page in order to access the controls for the digital controller. Here we're going to go to the IP address that lives on the Wi-Fi shield. This IP address will only be relevant on your local home network. Later I will show you how to access the Wi-Fi shield with a domain name from anywhere using a smartphone or a computer hooked up to the internet. This IP address is hard-coded into the Wi-Fi shield and is a static IP so that even if the power were to go out or the device were to be reset, it would still have the same IP address and thus be accessible still from the outside world. We also noticed that there's a different port number here here. Typically HTML is ported on port 80, however the IP camera that I showed you in my last project with the automated terrarium lives on port 80. So I had to do a little finagling and add a different port that supports HTML. So here we see my nice little HTML page. We have a nice picture of the blanket. Here we have the on button, the off button, some temperature controls, and a little readout that lets me know the current state of the controller. This is also useful if I, say, forget to turn off my electric blanket when I leave my house and turn it off if it was left on. We're going to click on the on button and you will see the display light up. The temperature is set to start at five default. And now let's say click on the high button. Uh, once the web page loads, we will see the device go up to high. We will then try to go low. And again, uh, it takes a little while for it to propagate through the internet, but once you have it, boom, jumps down to low. And as you can see, I still have manual controls over here, allowing me to change the temperature. And say I leave it at seven and I want to reload the web page over here. And once it reloads, you'll notice that the current temperature value is indeed seven. So in order to accomplish that, I needed to not only to be able to control these buttons, but also read when they were pressed low with a manual press. And that way the current state of the device can then be stored in the Arduino and accessed via the web page. So now I'm gonna show you the process I went through in order to set up the Wi-Fi shield the way I needed it to be set up. As I mentioned, it had to have a static IP address which required going in and tweaking some of the settings. The first thing I used was the SPI UART terminal found in the Wi-Fi library. This library can be found on the SparkFun webpage and is compatible with both old versions of Arduino and Arduino 1.0 and beyond. Here we have the SPI UART terminal program. This allows us to talk directly to the Wi-Fi shield without having to have the Arduino do the talking for us. And over here we have the Wi-Fi command reference guide. This is where you'll find all of the commands that you can enter while talking directly to the Wi-Fi shield. So this code is already uploaded to my Arduino, so we'll jump right into CoolTerm. You could use CoolTerm, TerraTerm, or any other terminal program to communicate with the Wi-Fi shield. First, we need to check the settings and make sure they're all correct. We have the right serial port, the right baud rate. We'll click OK. And once we connect, we should see a menu pop up. Now we just need to enter command mode, which is just three dollar signs, and you'll see this little CMD here. We can now enter any of the commands found within this reference guide. First thing, I'm going to do get IP with the optional command at the end, and this is gonna show us the IP address of the device. And as I mentioned, this is also on a different port. So in order to change this IP address, we're gonna use the set command. When thinking about setting the IP address of your device, it's important to note that on most home wireless networks, the IP addresses are usually dished out automatically by your wireless router. When this happens, different devices will receive different IP addresses after they are powered down or disconnected and taken somewhere else and then brought back to your home network. This is because IP addresses are constantly reused. There are not enough IP addresses in the world for all of the devices and thus when 
when one device quits using one IP address, the rest are stored and shared with other devices as needed. So here, I made sure to pick an IP address that I was certain wouldn't be shared with one of the other devices connected on my home network. In order to set this IP address, we use the set IP address command. As you see, it returns with an AOK, -okay, and the first step of our puzzle is complete. There are now a few other settings that were crucial in setting up this. As I mentioned, we're on a different port. So we can see over here, we have the set IP local port, and I just set this to 8080 in order to have the HTML on my other camera uh, ported outside. The next command that's important is the wireless LAN commands. We need to set the authentication mode. This depends on your wireless router. And as you can see, there is a variety of options here. I am on WPA2, so therefore I set this value to four. There's also joining methods that need to be set in order for your Wi-Fi shield to join automatically upon a restart. I selected the one in order to have it join with a preset SSID and a passkey. You can also set the name of your wireless network that you're trying to connect to with the set WLAN SSID command with the string being replaced by your the name of your wireless network. Then you would need to use the set WLAN phrase command in order to set the uh, passphrase for that said network. With that, your Wi-Fi shield is now set up and ready to be accessed from anywhere on your home network. Now let's go over the steps in order to set up a dynamic DNS domain name service for your Wi-Fi shield in order to access it from outside of your home. Here we are at my wireless router setup page. I am in the applications and gaming section, which is where you'll want to head. Each wireless router setup page is going to look different, but they should all have similar settings. Here you can see that I have some ports forwarded, and these are enabled in order to allow your wireless router to port them to the outside world for you to access on any web-based device. As I mentioned, we have port 80 up here, which is my wireless camera set up for the automated terrarium. Then we have a VNC connection. Don't pay any attention to that for now. And then we have what I've called HTTP2. This is set up on port 8080. And as you can see, here's the IP address of the Wi-Fi shield, which I showed you earlier, and this is in fact enabled. This is very important because without these ports set up, you will not be able to access your Wi-Fi shield from the outside world. Once you have configured your wireless router, the last piece of the puzzle is to set up a domain name so you can point your IP address from your home to the domain name and have a much easier way to access your Wi-Fi server from the outside world. The service I use is Dynamic DNS, or DYN.com. Unfortunately, they have gotten rid of their free option, and you now have to pay in order to use their services. If you have many devices you would like to redirect domain names, it is well worth paying for. However, there are other alternatives. One such alternative is freedns.afraid.org. Once you have signed up and created an account, it is as simple as clicking on Web Forward, and then add a new web forwarding service. As you can see, there are many domain names you can check from. And once you have that, you simply redirect it to your IP address. If you do not know your IP address, you can go to sites like whatismyip.com. Remember that this must be your home IP address and not the IP address of the Wi-Fi server itself. Once you have that set up, simply click Save and your domain name should now be linked to your Wi-Fi server. So now all that's left is to solder up some wires and turn this prototype into a final enclosed project that can sit by my bedside. And here we have the final version of this project. As you can see, I've placed all the electronics in a nice little SparkFun box, and we now have the web page pulled up on my iPhone where I can now access it from wherever I am. So on those late nights at the hackerspace, I can come home to a nice warm bed. And that's my project for this week. Another first world problem solved with hobbyist electronics. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you learned a little something about adding internet connectivity to your project. We'll see you again in another two weeks for another engineering roundtable.